Father, we come to you this morning with hearts of thanksgiving. And as your word reminds us and as your spirit constantly reminds us to think of how great you are, to be in awe of you, to respond out of love to all that you reveal of yourself to us through your creation, through your word, through other people. As we come this morning, God, we simply want to see you high and lifted up. We want to see you. We want to feel your presence. We want to tell you that we love you. We want to learn more of you. And we're thankful that you're so gracious in this process that your word refers to as sanctification, that you're graciously and lovingly and long-sufferingly fashioning us on your potter's wheel to be more like Jesus. Thanks, God, this morning for all that you're doing. And as we open up our time of prayer to petition on behalf of others, to give you praise, whatever it is this morning, we just pray that you'd be lifted up and glorified in our midst. What's coming up this Tuesday? It's election time, right? Our civic duty is to be voters. It's our civic duty to study the issues because we live in a country that's been given the freedom to vote. So please, study and vote. It's our Christian duty to pray and to love regardless of the outcome of the elections. And we all understand for the most people here tend to be on one certain side of the arguments of life and how this country is supposed to be run. But not everybody is. And so here's the reality. As uh, citizens of America, we do what we need to, to help the country stay on a track that we want or get it on the track that we see God wants it to be. But citizens of heaven, as citizens of heaven, guess what? It all plays out. God's still on the throne regardless of who's the president of the United States. And we as Christians are called to pray and honor that God, pray for those people that get elected, and then to love everybody. Especially who? The people we don't agree with. Scripture would often refer to them as enemies. Try to, don't see somebody that disagrees with you. Politically, is that an enemy, please? Because how many of us have those in our homes, in our families? right? And getting together at family times during these times, oh my, yeah, exactly. You're going, <laughs> today's Sunday gathering of family could be something that you're all just dreading because you know Tuesday's elections, you know somebody is going to try to convince you that you're wrong, where you're coming from politically. Remember, back up, we're citizens of heaven, the eternal kingdom, and that's where we really have our citizenship and we're just sojourners. We're passing through here, right? Okay, so, and as we prayed earlier, Lord, we just want your righteousness to reign in this nation. Yeah? I love that. Yeah, just like a baby with our bottle, that would be, yeah, sweetheart, hi, yes, yeah, you. That's great news to see when righteousness reigns, okay? So, I don't know if we're aware of how blessed we are to live in America Back in 1938, this is from uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago. He tells this true story. There was a district party conference that was being held in Moscow. <coughs> it was, provide, it was pre presided over by a new secretary for that district party. It's kind of basically like a, um, uh, it's a political entity for a certain area. I'm not exactly sure what we'd call that here. But this new secretary was replacing one that recently had been fired by Comrade Stalin. At the conclusion of the conference, Stalin is not here at the conference, they decided to do a tribute. And so as they called for the tribute to Comrade Stalin, the people who were on the stage stood and started clapping, and everybody else stood and started clapping. And they continued to clap. One minute, two minutes, Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. At about five minutes, all the people who were elderly at the place were a little bit on the exasperated side. But unlike the freedom that we have here in the United States of America, everyone was thinking, well, who's going to be the first one to stop clapping for Joseph Stalin? He's not here, but we know that there are members of his secret police here. 
and to stop clapping could be seen clearly as a sign of defiance. And so the clapping continued. Six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes. The faces of the people who actually supported Stalin were like, this is ridiculous because how does this work out? How does this end? Do we all just keep clapping until we fall over? Until we die? Well, there was a businessman that was there who basically said, you know, he's had enough. Unfortunately for him, he was sitting on the stage. Everybody was looking to that new secretary because as long as the new secretary stopped clapping and sat down, they could sit down and everybody they thought would be good. But the secretary was new and the last guy had been fired and it wasn't really necessarily sure what happened to the last guy where he went. Well, that businessman, after about 15 minutes, said, you know, kind of like enough is enough. (laughs) And so from this got a stern look on his face and just sat down on the stage. And as soon as he did that, everybody else, relief, stopped, sat down. After the meeting was over, the members of the secret police there at that time called the, part of the NKVD came and took that businessman, arrested him, And then they basically went and interrogated him. And when he got done signing his papers that were basically now going to put him in prison, which ended up being for about 10 years, this is what the director of the NKVD said to him. Don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Talk about pressure. Think about that on Tuesday. Think about that. Is that type of leadership in our country? Think about the fact that no, it's not, but it could be. And beloved, think about it now, backing up and looking at the fact of, I often feel awkward in times when we're in worship and we clap. Not clapping during the song, as we attempt to you know, keep it in time. But when we get done and we're like clapping as unto the Lord, Because it doesn't always seem like we're really excited. Because especially at times like this, I wonder, and please, this is for all of us, I wonder if we're clapping as loud for the Lord as we do when some guy runs this little piece of pigskin across the line. Uh And next week, you know, if, you know, know, Sean doesn't expect you at the end of every song to like clap like the people in 1938 Moscow. (laughs) And if you do, Sean's going to ask you, okay, guys, we get it. God gets it. We can move on to the next song. He's not going to strike somebody down with lightning because you sat down during worship, right? It has to be worship in spirit and in truth. But here's the reality. If we're going to understand what life is following Jesus is really about, we're going to have to understand this. The road to heaven, or as I worded it, the highway to heaven is a pressure cooker. There's going to be pressure from without and from within to either to conform to this world or to conform to the teachings of Christ. And even the pressures that come upon us from other well-intentioned Christians to conform to that of Christ need to kind of be pushed down and say, hey, what is the Spirit of God calling us to do? What does His Word tell us to do? And that's where we need to understand, in the midst of all of that beautiful stuff that He's doing with us on His potter's wheel, that there's love and grace in those hands. Because only he knows what the finished product that he's making in his mind looks like. And only he knows how to best get us to there, right? And so while we all are encouraging one another on this path, we all are going to have to go through pressure cooker stuff that I cannot come to Larry and say, Larry, guess what, man? Come on out of that pressure cooker. You don't need to be there. I'm not Lord. There are things that we have to walk through that if we don't learn the lesson now from what we're walking through, guess what just happens? You'll have to learn it again later. You'll have to go through it again some other time. Pain and suffering are part of following Jesus Christ. Yes, so are joy, peace, love, kindness, all of the fruit of the Spirit. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact and sometimes we aren't reminded of the fact that, hey, Pain and suffering is part of the deal of following him too. And scripture even tells us when it happens to do what? Rejoice. And wow, like the disciples, to actually count, God counted us worthy of suffering like Jesus did? (laughs) Hallelujah. Not our natural response, is it? 
But that is a supernatural response. So in chapter 14, I'm not going to read through it today because we are somewhat pressed for time. We'll read as we go. Beginning in verse 1, Father, thank you for your word this morning that's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It never returns void. Always accomplishes what you set forth it to do. Help us to yield to what your Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts and our lives this day. And may the words that come from my mouth be yours. For only those words can change what we all need to have changed in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. How many of you have ever been to Iconium? How many of you have ever even heard of Iconium except outside of this? Those of you who have little children. Muconium, right? Is it Muconium or Merconium? Yeah, right, exactly. Totally different. Yes, exactly. (laughs) One person who knows medical stuff is laughing. Okay, it's good. Iconium simply means little image. It's about 60 miles east of Antioch, where you all were with Carl last week in the end of chapter 13. Remember, this was Antioch and Pisidia, which over in Asia Minor, not the Antioch where the Christians were first called, or where the followers of Jesus were first called Christians in what modern day Syria is. This is an area called Iconium. It was the capital of a place called Lyconia. Uh, Really, there isn't a whole lot known too much about it that's interesting. You can go look it up yourself if you want. But there is one thing that got brought out and everything. It was surrounded by a high wall. And every time I hear about something surrounded by a high wall, I always go back to this place called Jericho. And I always think of those high walls. Oh, look at that. The sun is coming through. And it's shining on Larry and Karen. (laughs) This high walls always kind of symbolize the attempt of the world to stop the good news of the gospel coming in. And it reminds me of the fact that we as the church are called to do what? Storm the gates with love, with our weapon of the love of Jesus. That's how we storm the gates of the enemy and that's how we are guaranteed victory in the end. Here we are now at this place which is actually in Turkey, modern day, it's called Konya, Um, It doesn't necessarily have any Old Testament significance to it. So, here we are. At a synagogue of the Jews, what had just happened in Antioch. The apostles were basically kicked out of Antioch, Pisidia, from the synagogues of the Jews. Where do they go next? They move to another place 60 miles away, and where do they initially go? To the synagogue of the Jews. Why? Why? They happened to be Jews too. They were just completed now. And so in essence, they went where they would naturally go. You hear me say this all the time, but it's scripture. In the Great Commission, Matthew 28, that many of us have memorized from verses 18 to 20, go is actually better rendered there as as you go. So not so much as we need to make programs to go, which is nothing wrong with those as far as sharing the gospel, but the natural way is as you go through life, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you. You don't have to come up with schemes and devices of going to places, because guess what? You're already going places. You're going to work. You're going to recreate. You're going to Safeway. And please don't go to the one, where's that, Sean? The one down in, yeah, that place where it's real. I mean, it's bad. You need to take your life into your own hands going there. Um, It's You're going places, right? We all go places. And wherever it is that we go, be prepared to be an ambassador for the good news of Jesus. And it's amazing if we're simply in a mindset of, Lord, let me be a blessing to somebody today. It's amazing the things that we can do that make others just go, wow, why did you do that? Simple little things like letting somebody who's only got two things in their basket or in their hands go in front of you because you have a basket full or even if you just have three. Ooh, that's even a better one, right? I have three things, you only have two, go ahead. I'm in no rush. It's an opportunity to begin a conversation that lets people see that, wow, that's different. Why would you do that? You know what, I'm so blessed by God today and I just wanna pass the blessing on to somebody. Oh, you believe in God? I don't believe in God. And all of a sudden, guess what? 
You can have a conversation with somebody that you don't even know and bring up the good news of Jesus. That's why these guys are going to synagogues. It actually made it easier in one sense though, right? Because they already had a common ground of their religious background. Because they could come in and basically talk to anybody about, you know, the Messiah that we're waiting all for? We know who he is. Beloved, there are so many things that we can do to take the gospel wherever we are. Are we? Are we actually doing that? Or are we seeing that as a possibility? Especially at our workplaces and the places that we go to on a regular basis. Those people seeing us on a regular basis. Are we letting them know that we actually have something that nobody else has if they don't have Jesus? Are we speaking and are we loving through our words and through our actions? So they're here at the synagogue of the Jews, but look what they do. So they spoke that a great multitude of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. Who believed here? Jews and Greeks. One gospel goes to people of Jewish backgrounds, people of Islamic backgrounds, people of you name it backgrounds. It's one gospel. It's not a different gospel for wherever you came back from. It's one gospel. And here's the good news. Um, first, the bad news. Everybody's under sin. Every single person born on the planet is under sin. doesn't matter what you were born into religious-wise. You're under sin. And there's only one way that that sin can be taken care of. It's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. And see, people would say, well, that's a very myopic view. That's why you Christians are so narrow-minded. Well, guess what? Go do your research then. Go look and see what the other religions are offering you concerning your sin. And you'll find out that really they don't. And the ones that do, there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. Allah is extremely capricious. I think I've shared this before. Uh, the imam who trained the leaders of ISIS, al-Baghdadi on down, I've had the blessing to sit with him a couple times and talk. Because we adopted 20 children, he believes in his heart and his mind wholeheartedly that I'm going to heaven. When we asked him the question about him going, he said, I don't know, inshallah, God willing, he's hopeful. And I thought to myself, somebody who is quote-unquote dedicated to their faith and teaching their faith, he has no assurance of his salvation. What kind of life is that, beloved? And that is what everybody who's living out there without Jesus is living through. They have no idea. They're just hopeful. And in many senses, well, I just hope my bad stuff isn't outweighing my good stuff. Said, Brother, sorry, because even your good stuff, according to Scripture, it's bad. It's all bad. It's all bad.com. Sorry. <laughs> you need a Savior. We all need a Savior. And this is what Paul is doing. They're speaking in a way that they're getting to the heart of the issue so that what? Multitudes of the Jews and the Greeks believed. One message for all, salvation is only in Jesus. But here's what happens. Whenever God is moving through the truth of the gospel, verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Unbelievers come kind of like in two categories. The kind that, well, that's kind of okay for you, but this is okay for me. So you just do what you want, and I'll do what I want. We're all good. But then there's this other group says, that's wrong what they're doing. They're giving people false hope in this Jesus. There is no afterlife. There is no God. And then they take it upon themselves to be the crusaders for what they see as truth. And they do things. And it says they poisoned their minds. In the original language, that means they made their minds evil affected. Understand that when people are trying to come against the truth of the gospel... It's evil. Jesus made it really clear to us when we went through the Gospel of John, right? You're either scattering with me or scattering. Two teams. Understand that when our loved ones and our family members and the people we work with and the people that we recreate with come against the Gospel, they're just under the influence of evil. It's okay. Because guess what? Were we once under the influence of evil? And guess what? Is not evil still trying to influence even though we've been sealed with the promise of the Spirit? Yes. But we must understand the schemes and the devices of the enemy that he's trying to affect our minds. The mind's the battle. What are those fiery darts that the enemy sends go to? Is he trying to stub you in your toe? 
with a fiery dart? Is he trying to hit you actually in your your Achilles so that you walk like this or that you can't walk at all? His fiery darts are being sent straight to our minds. Peter told us this, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's he telling us? We have a part to play in all of this. That we literally have to understand that the battlefield is in our minds and when the enemy's fiery darts come, what has God given us? He's given us his armor. And so when the fiery darts come in, what goes up? A shield of faith. And you know what's on your head? It's a helmet of salvation. But just like every other helmet, it doesn't cover everything. And so if we don't realize the schemes of the enemy and his devices, guess what can happen? Those fiery darts can land. And when those fiery darts land, it now gives the enemy a foothold. And he wants to take that foothold and build what from it? A stronghold. It's all he's trying to do, chipping away. That's what he does. So what do we need to do? Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, family, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, good report. If there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, meditate is not going into some place on a high mountain, crossing your legs in an uncomfortable position and going om, om, om. Biblical meditation simply means what? Think about these things, to dwell on these things and understand that if we'll dwell on the good things, you know what that does? In essence, it builds a wall around us for that when the bad stuff comes, when those fiery darts come, you want nothing to do with it. Anybody ever had like really good food of your favorite thing? Like you've had it and you thought to yourself, there will never be anything as good as this. For those of you who are steak eaters, I remember being in a foreign country where they got served, a, I think they call it a tomahawk for the first time. It's basically a ribeye steak, but the bone is like this long. It's kind of funny because I think they charge you a ton for that thing that you're not even going to eat because it's crazy expensive. I didn't pay for it. Somebody else did. But when I ate that meat, I thought to myself, this is, this is from heaven. For a carnivore, there is no better steak I've ever had in my life. And I thought, but this is nothing in compared to what God has in store for me. This is why God wants us to meditate on his word. That way we would hide his word in our heart. Because according to scripture, if we hide his word in our heart with the intent of not sinning, guess what happens? We're empowered to be able, when the devil comes trying to tempt us, to say what? Uh, just like Jesus, thus saith the Lord, it is written that I shouldn't do this. So guess what? I'm not going to do it. I have so many other free things that God has given me that I can do. But you're trying to entice me, just like you did in the Garden of Eden. How many commandments did Adam and Eve have? Uno. What was the one that seemed the enemy came at? That one, right? Beloved, we need to understand that if we will do our part in this understanding that this is part of our spiritual battle that we do to meditate on these things, to actually come to his word and to focus on it, we'll be stronger spiritually. And that's why we're committed here at Freedom to teach through God's word and to encourage us to read God's word. Last night, all day yesterday, I actually uh, ended up working because the person whose house that we're remodeling some things for is handicapped. And we had to do some stuff with the plumbing, which started four days ago, which we thought we'd be done with in a day. But it's an older house built in the 50s. So every time we fix something, something else was showing. Well, you know, we don't work on Sundays. Pastors do, but we try not to do our construction stuff on Sundays. And sure enough, yesterday was like, if we don't get his plumbing done, this God, they just moved in yesterday. The movers came in. All the beds and everything are there. If we don't get his plumbing done, he can't have a bathroom. And that was the whole driving thing for us. Because anybody ever been someplace where you haven't had a bathroom that you could use? We felt this, and the guy loves Jesus. So it's been a great joy working for him and his wife. But it's like, we got to get this bathroom done for him. Beloved, this understanding of focus on the things that are good, it's like understanding that, hey, if I don't meditate on the good things, 
It's kind of like being a handicapped person that doesn't have a bathroom that they can't get to. There's no relief. There's no comfort. There's things that I need to get rid of that I can't, but when we come and focus on Scripture, that's what will happen. We'll be able to get the relief that God designed for us to have. So, Paul and Barnabas now, it says in verse 3, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Therefore, they stayed there. Why did they stay there a long time? We saw in verse 1. They preached in a way that many got saved. Paul would speak of this later in 1 Corinthians 16, 9 and referring it this way. For a great and effective door is open to me and there are many adversaries. Understand this, beloved. If God has something for you that is an open and effective door for the gospel to go forward, guess what you're going to have? Many adversaries. And sometimes the adversaries aren't necessarily going to come from where you think of. The devil is very shrewd. Sometimes the adversaries come from people that are extremely close to you. Because that's really where it hurts the most. Paul talks about this very clearly, about people that he once served with that had now left the faith or had simply just left him. So understand, when they're here, they get the fact that, hey, God's opened up a door and we're going to step through it, but guess what? We expect the adversaries, and this is the exhortation for many of us today. If you feel like you have adversaries because of your faith in Christ, realize it's going to happen until you see him face to face. It's just part of life. Now, if you are bringing things on you because you're acting like an idiot, don't try to claim that as persecution. But if you are doing things to the best of your ability, according to God's word, and you've got adversaries, it just comes with the territory. So deal with it. Get over it. If you haven't figured this out yet, everybody doesn't like you. I know, Matt, that's really hard to understand at your age. But have you kind of picked up on that already, though? Yeah. You are never going to have everybody like you. And to live a life trying to just to get everybody to like you, you'll be a chameleon. I was that way in school. I was, you name it, National Honor Society member, did all the sports, did all the, the, the government stuff, but then did all the party and did all the drugs. I was a chameleon. I could fit in every single place that I went, and I did. But there's no peace in it. I wasn't happy in the long run, and I'm very thankful to have gotten out with as few scars as I did. But this is what the gospel does, and because the gospel is being as preached and it's being effective, guess what? If you're seeing the effectiveness of it, stay there. I met a young man on one of uh, my journeys that um, he managed not an upper level manage, but an assistant management in a McDonald's. Super sweet young man, loved Jesus. <clears throat> we met serving um, with a ministry called CIA, Christ in Action. And we were in a place that had been flooded, and I can't remember where it was, but we were there basically ripping out people's drywall and stuff that had been affected because of the flooding. Uh, ripping out stuff that we had no right to rip out, looking back now, you know, just the asbestos and all the stuff and just not having the right equipment. But, you know, for the love of Christ that compels us, we'll go out and do some crazy stuff sometimes. One of the nights when we were sitting there laying on our cots, we got to talking and he started sharing with me about the fact that being a manager in McDonald's, he found a group of people that God obviously wanted him to minister to because he had kind of had enough of McDonald's, but he realized that God had placed him there. And God impressed upon his heart. He said, these are the least of these. If you've ever worked at McDonald's or any type of fast food joint, it's basically seen as the job that you take because you couldn't get a real job. Right? Yeah? And what he realized was is that McDonald's at that time forced everybody to take breaks together in a specific place within the restaurant. You couldn't just go on a break by yourself. At least this is when I was dealing with him, and at least maybe that's the way it was in the South where he came from. But he realized that by being forced to take breaks with his coworkers, 
He got to hear their stories. And when he got to hear their stories, he realized they all basically were carrying the chip around on their shoulder if I'm really, an, you know, I'm a loser. I work at McDonald's. And they had no hope of getting out of there. And they, he got to bring the glory of God into those situations. And I want to encourage you, beloved. I was last night picking up pizza at work uh, at the Domino's uh, down in Pueblo here on Prairie. And as I walked in, if you know the one that's on Prairie, it's just a little square building. And there was no cars in the parking lot on a Saturday night. It was weird. I walked in. There's five people in there with like 39 million pizzas that they were making for takeout or for delivery. And I thought to myself, I wonder if this is kind of like a McDonald's job. And so as they were bringing my pizza, I said, hey, everybody, sorry to interrupt. I just want to thank you guys for doing what you do because if you aren't working here, I can't get pizza right now. And I don't know if you know this right now, but pizza to me right now is a huge blessing. So you guys are all blessings. So thank you so much for making the pizza for me and God bless you all. You should have seen the shock on their faces. And we're all kind of laughing because, yeah, we have those opportunities, beloved, to simply to do that. And I thought to myself as I left there, it'd be a fun outreach for us, wouldn't it? To go like on a Friday night, split up into groups, and go into those places, I don't know, with gift cards for like real food, like some steakhouse or something, and walk in and say, we just want to love you guys in the name of Jesus, because if you guys don't do your job, we don't get the opportunity to get what we need right now. When's the last time, like driving through McDonald's for breakfast, that dollar coffee for a large dollar, or if you get two of them for 40 ounces, you know what, for two dollars, that blesses. Do, you, do we let people know that what they're doing bless us? You don't necessarily have all the time in the world to give the whole gospel message, but you can plant the seeds of the love of the gospel to where I've gone back into places where people said, you're the crazy guy. You're the crazy guy that thanked us for the extra tomatoes on your Whopper that we charged you 20 cents for because they charge you now for certain things. Yeah, right? And they're, oh, yeah. And it's like those types of things, beloved, are we taking the opportunities so that our actions are speaking boldly in the Lord that we're his followers? Are we? We have the opportunity. And I know it sounds a little crazy, but try it. And I'd love to start hearing people coming back. Can I share about the crazy thing I tried this week to tell somebody about Jesus? Yes, do it try it. But do it because you're sensing the love of God compelling you to take a few steps of faith to bring the good news that you've got. We all have this treasure. Oh, Jesus, are we giving out? I hope so. That's what our exhortation is. And this is not Chaz saying, thou shalt go do this. That doesn't work. This is, I believe, the Spirit of God telling us all, are we taking the opportunities to simply love people as the apostles did when they went wherever they went. Why? Because this is how we bear witness to the word of his grace. And when we bear witness to the word of his grace, sometimes God is going to grant signs and wonders to be done by their hands. I cannot tell you how many times some really cool stuff that God has done through healings and everything else, just because this conversation began like something like I just shared with you. Or turning around in a Starbucks if you go to places like that and standing in line and asking, can I buy you your coffee? Why would you want to do that? I'm just so blessed by God and I just want to bless you. Is that, is that weird? Yeah, I know, but I, can I? I've never had anybody deny. I said, I'm not going to say anything else. I'm not going to try to get you to sit down and try to sell you something. I would say 90% of the time, they start talking to you, though, about real issues because the world is lacking the light of love. Do we not see that? The enemy has gotten so good at making division and strife and hatred normal within our country now. And who is called to bring the light of love? Who's going to bring it if the church doesn't? I'll tell you who's going to bring it. The cults. Cults are really good at bringing what they say is the love and the truth of Jesus. But it ain't. So why aren't we? We need to. In this word of his grace, oh my. The word of his grace. The gospel. That's another term for it. Because it's a gracious God that doesn't send us all to hell. Even though we deserve it. It's grace that we're saved through. 
And so are we bringing this grace to a lost and dying world? Well, verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided. Huh. Does that sound familiar? Part side with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. Beloved, the gospel divides. It's truth. It rightly divides. And there is the side that gathers on one side, and there's the side that scatters. So don't be surprised when the gospel is that which causes division. But guess what? There's something really cool about this. In verse 4 in chapter 14, this is the first time, it's not direct, but this is the first time that Paul and, in this case, Barnabas, are referred to as apostles. See, up until this time, pretty much it only had been seen as the 12 that walked with Christ, and we knew that Judas went away, and then they replaced him with Matthias, which you don't really hear much about. But Paul and Barnabas are seen here as apostles. Why? Because they were set out to do. They set out to do. Beloved, if you're out on mission for God, you don't have to wear a black suit and a black tie and a cool fedora and always hear dun, 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 music in the background you're going to be on a mission from God, right? You don't have to be the Blues Brothers. If we are simply trying to do what God has for us, we're on a mission from God. Just like Paul and Barnabas, we're apostles. But guess what? If you're going to be an apostle, a sent one, um, violent attempts may be made on your life. (laughs) It's reality. Can anybody here tell me that you know somebody who isn't going to die or fly? Got to throw that one in, right? We are all guaranteed on planet Earth to either die or fly someday. Can we just get over the fact that we're all going to die someday and start living? Knowing that, guess what? I would rather be living and doing what God wants me to do when I die than to be doing something else. And if we can get over the fact that we're actually going to die someday, you know what we see in Revelation 12, 11? That that's how you overcome the devil. The blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. I can't tell you how many times that I've been in Iraq where easily could have been dead soon. I will tell you the upcoming trip shouldn't be in those places because kind of the ISIS thing, it's, the, the war's no longer going on. But a couple years ago when I was going, embedded with the Iraqi army front lines, embedded with the Kurdish army front lines, driving supplies through areas where we're getting mortared, and literally laughing, knowing that this could be the way I die. Wow, this would be a really cool way to enter heaven. I know that may sound weird to you, and please understand, I do not have a death wish. But when God puts you into places to where he has you to do what he wants, you'll see things differently, and you'll see things from a broader perspective, is that if by my death others will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, so be it. If by my life others will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, so be it. So whether I live or die, for me, to die. Life is Christ, but to die is gain. This is what Paul is learning. And it's a long process for us to learn sometimes. But understand this. These cities of Lystra and Derbe, these cities of Lycaonia and the surrounding region, this used to perplex historians and archaeologists because it didn't make sense to them. There was a man by the name of, uh, he's now, he was knighted later in life, William Mitchell Ramsey. So he's listed as Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. He was a Scottish archaeologist, educated in the late 19th century in a school uh, known as uh, Tubingen. That was actually its name. This school basically taught him that the New Testament wasn't reliable. A bunch of fables. So as a good archaeologist, he set out to put the writer of the book of Acts because he had a desire for Asia Minor to learn about it. He basically was going to put Luke on trial. He wanted to prove that they really, this book was really fables. After a lifetime of archaeological research in Asia Minor, two conclusions he made on the screen right there. Number one, further studies showed that the book of Acts could bear the most minute scrutiny as the authority for the facts of the Aegean world and that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and perception of truth as to be a model historical statement. This is a man who got multiple high-level degrees, got chairs at Oxford. 
that near the end of his life and all of his life of study said, hey, you know what? <laughs> Luke was a master historian. Why do I bring this up? We'll get to the second part here too. The second one from the same book, I set out to look for truth on the borderland where Greece and Asia meet and found it there in Acts. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians and they stand the keenest scrutiny and hardest treatment. Beloved, so many times the enemy comes throwing lies concerning the validity and the reliability of Scripture. But when people set out to prove the Bible wrong, I love it. Because nobody has ever done it. And you know what seems to always happen when somebody says, I'm going to set out to prove the Bible wrong? They get converted. Why? Because what does the word of God say about it? It never returns void. So if you've got family members or friends or people that you work with who are skeptics, challenge them. Hey, so I know that you don't believe this. Do you believe it because you've read it and seen that it's just a bunch of malarkey? And if they say yes, that they've read it, how much of it have you read? The whole thing? Well, no. Well, I challenge you just to read the whole thing. And at the end, when you've done read, or you're done reading it all, you can come back and tell me why I should stop reading it. It's a great evangelistic method, beloved, and it doesn't cost you much effort except some t- telling them. And it's, in essence, you're baiting them right into the trap, right? Oh, yeah, you think it's wrong? Well, then at least read it if you're going to call them out on that. Call them out on the fact that they need, if you're going to really say that this is not true, then you should have a basis for it. These two cities are only in this province from the 37th year AD to the 72nd year. These two cities of, forgive me, Derby and Lystra are only in this province for these 25 years, kind of where Paul is talking about this. And then after that, they realigned, you know, even back then, they redrew the district. And so they were no longer in the same district. And this is why one of the reasons why Ramsey was like, man, this was amazing. This is obviously historical truth. But look at, here's the spiritual truth about it that's even more important. What were they doing? They were preaching the gospel there. They're preaching the gospel there. Now, do you remember when we were at the beginning of Acts chapter 13, that when they were praying, what did God say? Separate unto me. Saul and Barnabas. There's a rather thriving church there, hundreds we believe. But there was only two that were called out to go on this special mission. This is the way God works sometimes, beloved. Doesn't mean that the others were anything less, but God had a specific plan for them. And so when others go, and you know it's my heart to plant several other Calvaries here in Pueblo in the south. When that happens... It's a good thing, right? It's a great thing because this is what the gospel is meant to do. That The gospel gets preached, people get saved, they get discipled, and then those who God has called to go, they go someplace else. I'm looking forward, Lord willing, to Carl pastoring somewhere. I'm looking forward to Sean pastoring somewhere. Looking forward to Mike pastoring somewhere. And there's maybe somebody else here that I don't even know about yet that God has a plan for. I'm looking forward to all those things. And while it's hard to let people go, The understanding is that if we multiply ourselves, fewer people go to hell. That's the beauty of it. More people get to spend the eternal slumber party at Jesus' house with with us, all of us. That's what the gospel is all about. And so that's what they're doing. And it's interesting here because they get to this point now where there's this, in verse 8, we go from this, they're preaching the gospel there, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb had never walked, This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. The man was a cripple from his mother's womb, had never walked normally in his entire life. We're not exactly sure how old he is, but we know he's a man. We've had this for a while. But what did the man hear? The man heard, it says, Paul speaking. Speaking about what? Paul was an evangelist. Paul was telling them the good news of Jesus. Paul was letting them know that sin could be dealt with. He was giving them the gospel. And then guess what God decided to do? 
God decided to do something amazing in the, in the physical realm. But Paul was not there as an itinerant healer saying, come get healed, and then preaching the gospel. No, he was there preaching the gospel. The reason being, what's more important, whether somebody can walk now in this life or whether they can walk into eternity and have their sin forgiven. That's what the importance is. The importance is the message of the gospel. And if God chooses, he'll give some people along the way some blessings in this life that we would see as blessings in the physical realm. But it's no guarantee. And guess what? What's really the most important thing? While somebody who has been in this situation all their life, I can't relate to this. Well, I could see, though, that their whole focus in life was, if only I could be normal. If only I could be able to walk. Well, I can see that. Guess what? In the reality of eternity, 70 or 80 years of being a cripple versus an eternity of hell. Drop in the bucket, right? So we have compassion. We have sympathy and understanding for those who have any type of whatever you want to call it, challenge like this. But the reality is all of mankind is under sin. And so therefore we need to speak the gospel boldly because people will hear. And sometimes you're going to see people like this. Paul says it intently looking at him, realize he had faith to be healed. He believed so much. And what Paul was saying was that God was moving at this moment. And so Paul's response, stand up straight in your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now, I've been in places where people thought that this was happening and spoke those words to people, and they weren't able to stand up. But I have been in other places where it's happened. So is there some type of normative that we're supposed to follow here from this? I would say follow what the Lord's leading. Speak the gospel and if you think that there's something that the Spirit's on, go ahead, speak it, believing, and if it doesn't happen, the important thing is that the gospel goes out. But the main thing is we need to see what's important. We need to be very careful that we're not giving people false hope or trying to make them see that the gospel is attached to you didn't get healed because you didn't believe concerning the physical healing. Spiritual is what is the most important because it's eternal. So when the people saw what Paul had done, verse 11, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, which is number one, big dog God. And Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands and gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Perspective, yeah, beloved? perspective. They were responding in a way that they only knew how because this is all they'd been taught. But here's what the gospel and the truth of the gospel does. Paul, verse 14, when apostles of Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. You have to understand that when you are used by God, Sometimes people see you as God and there is a danger for any human being when God works through them to take those accolades on themselves and all of a sudden to forget that they're servants of God and all of a sudden now they think they're something. Danger. And it doesn't take 10,000 people to make that happen. 10 people showing up to your study every week could all of a sudden make somebody go, man, I'm going to be the pastor of the biggest church in the world someday. Happens. Be aware that we need to have this same type of mindset, just like Paul. We're men. We're human beings with the same nature as you. 
if I am ever making you think that I'm talking down to you, <laughs> Larry, Alex, Ray, Wes, Carl, that's why they're here to kick me in the behind. Say, hey, dude, we've been noticing lately, it kind of seems like you're preaching down at us, like you got it all together and nobody else does. If that's ever the case, that's why I've got this type of board. We all need to understand we're all human beings with the same kind of nature. But we're also all human beings who've been filled with the Spirit of God so that our nature should be changing. So we should be growing. We should be maturing. We should be making progress in our sanctification. But even all of that, who's the judge? Where that's supposed to be at? The Lord. And so that's why grace is involved. Understanding it's God's grace that will get us all through to the end. And we need to turn from the useless things to the living God. The danger within the church of the 21st and 20th century is that it became okay to turn back to the useless things, even though that you had the living God. And we're all in process of shedding off some of the useless things. But the fact of the matter is we all need to be exhorted to focus on the things that are good, to meditate, to see what Scripture says, what is good, and to focus on those things. And to have that heart that is open to hear that, God, my heart's breaking because I lost our beloved dog, and to hear the Spirit of God say, man, I created that dog. He was a good friend to you. But I've also created your family members and the people around you in your neighborhood. Do you have the same heart for them that you had for the dog? We need to be willing to hear the Spirit of God and know that he's saying that in a way to continue to fashion and to mold us, to help us to grow. It's not, I know I made the dog. He's not yelling at us, beloved. He's lovingly come on and helping us to see, oh man, Lord, that was powerful. Cuts like a knife, but powerful. And how you grow from those things is exactly how we desire to grow, right? Right? Because the God that they're referring to here, this living God, what's he say? It's God who made the heaven, made the earth, made the sea and all things that are in them. This is the God of creation. Those things that you're talking about, Zeus, Hermes, useless. The God we're talking about, all that's around us here, all you can see and all that you can't see, he made. And he made it by simply speaking it into existence that's the God. He's amazing. And he's the one and only true God. Well, in bygone generations that he allowed the nations to walk in their own ways. And at the end, after they spoke the truth, did the people come immediately to their understanding? That's, oh, that's right. No. What? <laughs> they still wanted to sacrifice to them. Yeah, we heard you, buddy. But at the same time, we still need to sacrifice to you because you're Zeus and you're Hermes. No. Sometimes, beloved, we need to understand people don't get it right away, right? And that's why with our family members who aren't getting our attempts to share the good news with them, it's okay. God's working it out. Don't stop. Don't stop thinking that it ain't ever going to happen. No, we walk by faith, not by sight. And how many of us, it took a while, <laughs> right? I'm so thankful to know people that have come to know the Lord as Savior, past 40 or past 50 or past 60 years old. Guess what? As long as there's breath, there's hope for all of our friends and family members because they have an innate desire to worship something and they're going to worship something or someone. They're going to, right? So are we going to give them that option that maybe nobody's ever pointed them to about the God who made all that is seen and unseen? Well, once again, these lovely adversaries. Verse 19, Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and they persuaded the multitudes. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went in the city. And the next day he parted with Barnabas to Derby. Put yourself in Paul's shoes. <laughs> you come, you preach the gospel. They think you're Zeus. Or actually, they thought Paul was Hermes. They think Barnabas is Zeus. They're actually calling you like gods. Talk about rock star status, huh? And then what happens? The bad guys come in and they take those who they wanted to see as gods and do what? Stoned him. They literally stoned him. And they thought he was dead. So this was not like, 
oh, you know, light, little, they actually thought they got their job done. Can't wait to see this one in the DVDs in heaven, right? But then when the disciples gathered around, I, you know, it doesn't tell us what the disciples do. It doesn't say that they prayed. It doesn't say they did anything. It just, I'm sure there's kind of like, well, shock. Like, Paul? <laughs> uh, Paul? God? Something happens and boom, he's up. And instead of running, goes back into the city. Oh, let's go back in. If God wanted me to die here, I think I would have died already. So let's just go back. And so they go back in, verse 21. What do they do? Preach the gospel of the city again. Preach the gospel of the city. And made many disciples. And then they left. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith, saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. The only way people ever become disciples, beloved, is the gospel's preached. And it does not need to be preached at stadiums only. As a matter of fact, what you will find, statistics say, the vast majority of people become Christians not because they went to a stadium event, but because somebody, a family, a friend, or maybe even a stranger, individually shared the gospel with them. So preach the gospel, and we'll see people, many turn to Christ, and that gives them the opportunity to become his disciples. But then, guess what? They came back to where they had been before, they strengthened the souls of the disciples were there, exhorting them to do what? Continue in the faith. Beloved, the world that we live in, doesn't matter if it was biblical times or now, constantly tries to get us to drift away, to backslide, to go away. How many of us know people, and I would like looking at Sean and Brianna with the numbers of people that you actually worked with at the Bible college that you're aware of that used to be on fire for Jesus who are now saying, he, no, it's, it's not. Beloved, this is what the world wants and this is what the world's trying to do to us. So the exhortation from Scripture, the exhortation from the Spirit of God is continue in the faith. Keep on walking and understand this. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Tribulations, pressure, oppression, adversaries. It's a pressure cooker. We will suffer if we were going to continue to be focused on the kingdom of heaven. So just let's get over it, okay? <laughs> let's get over that it's going to be hard. And let's encourage one another that it's worth it. Why? Because what did Jesus take for us? We were up in the Littleton a couple of weeks ago building a fence and the fence was eight feet tall and so the posts were actually 13 feet long that we had to set into the ground. Um, Mike has bad knees and a bad back. I just have a bad back. So I get to carry a lot of heavy stuff. And I kid you not, the first time I picked one of those up, I said, I do not want to do this anymore as we were carrying them from the truck to the back and then it hit me. Jesus carried worse than this for me. And then all of a sudden, my attitude changed. Because every time I grabbed one of those posts and was carrying it to the back, I thought of Jesus. And you know what ended up happening? I actually started enjoying carrying those. Because I realized this is nothing compared to what God did for me. And I'm getting a glimpse, an iota of what he went through from me. And it's making me, drawing me, love him more. Beloved, let's get over it. We're going to go through trials. We're going to go through tribulations because if we want to follow Jesus, it's just part of the plan. And we get to, as scripture says, the opportunity to suffer like him and we should rejoice in it. Verse 23, it's where we close. So then when they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. God bless you. You can go and read and you can look at the maps and see how this all went out. But eldership in the church was appointed. 
There was prayer. There was fasting. They commended them to the Lord because guess what they were doing? We got to go. God's in control. You've got the Lord. You've got leaders that are going to help point you to the Lord. They didn't have Bibles yet, beloved. (laughs) If anything, they might have had James' letter. They might have had something else, maybe one from Galatia. We don't know yet concerning those time frames. But the fact of the matter is they had Scripture. They had the Old Testament. But they didn't have them all in their house. But they had the Spirit of God who was leading and guiding them. And as the Spirit of God was leading those who he'd set apart to go to different places, this is that work which they'd accomplished. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 14 covers just a little over two years. This is all God gave us out of Paul's first journey is what we see in Acts 13 and Acts 14 and what he mentions here. I'll get to it down here in 2 Timothy. 1,200 plus miles covered over land and water, 12 plus congregations established, but the gospel was preached to many. That's the work that he called them out to. And when Paul writes to Timothy later in his life about this, in 2 Timothy 3, 10, 11, he said this, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. As Paul was writing to a young Timothy saying, guess what, bro? (laughs) If you're going to be in this position, here's what's going to happen. And you already saw what God did with me. So the exhortation to Timothy is the same one that you get from me this morning. God's faithful, beloved. And have we really within our hearts decided that it's worth following him? I hope so. May waver. You come back on Sundays, you get charged up again. You go out through the week, you have some victories, you have some setbacks. Come back, you get filled up. You're filling up in the morning, hopefully on your own, in the afternoon, in the evening. You're coming to him and seeking him out because the church that was gathered together here in verse 27, that's what the church is about. We're a big barbecue. And we like big barbecues, don't we, too? But we're a big barbecue, and each one of us is a coal. And when we come in on Sundays, you know what happens when you put glowing charcoal briquettes together? It's even hotter. You know what happens when you take one out all by itself? It's tough staying lit when you're alone. Not impossible. You come to the Word of God, you come to His Spirit, yes. But this is why I believe God, in His design of human beings, made us social beings, and then also said, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. And from the time of the Jews till now... One day out of seven, he's all, that's all he's asking for at a minimum. But you'll find that the more that you lean into the Lord and lean into his people, what happens? We're ignited. We're even more on fire. And we'll be able to tell each other about the great things that God has done with us. He'll open the door of faith to non-believers. And hopefully we'll get to stay together for a long time. But what's a long time? It's relative Certain things in God's creation, he only designed to last for a very short time, yet they have very productive and very beautiful lives. So let's be mindful of the fact that the purpose of the gospel is to change lives for eternity, and the purpose of the church is to be ambassadors of the gospel. He gives us opportunities on a daily basis, and so let's make that commitment to simply be his, to simply Love the fact that right where we are is where he's got us, and he's going to have us there. We're in the palm of his hand, and nothing and no one can snatch us out from there. And be encouraged today that he's not looking down and saying, loser, slacker, sure wish you'd get your act together. He's not. What he's looking at, he's saying, my precious child, there's some things that you probably need to grow more in. And if you'll lay some things down, you'll grow. And if you won't lay them down, I am going to graciously sometime take those things away and help you. He's a loving dad in all of this. And so be encouraged today. It doesn't matter where you're at. He loves us, and he will be faithful to complete that which he began in us. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the examples that you work through people like Paul, like Barnabas, like all those people who heard the message and became your followers, and even the ones who didn't become your followers when this is initially recorded, we know that the seed of the gospel gets planted. And when it gets planted, it'll bear fruit. 
And so as we've come today to hear from you, to be encouraged, thank you, Lord, that you are gracious and merciful with us. Thank you that you've given us the opportunity to be in a place where we can openly worship you. And thank you once again this morning for the beauty of this place that you've given us. We're here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you once again.